Today I'd just like to discuss um, some early bassinet visors and sort of discuss the dangers of really interpreting historical artwork as historically accurate. Ian Laspina, Knight Errant, has some videos up on this topic. I recommend you go watch them, I'll link them below. But I, I wanted to sort of add my own research and some of the sources and interpretations that I've come across in my own research. So I'll be pulling from this book entitled Medieval Warfare by Timothy Newark, first published in 1979. I have here the 1988 edition. You can see that. First thing that struck me was the illustration on the cover. And on the back flap it says, The Crusades from a 15th century manuscript, courtesy of the National Library in Paris. This illum illumination is, or illustration, sorry, is a 1490 illustration by Sebastian Marmoret, a French artist. The interesting thing that strikes me is if you look at the arms and armor depicted on this illustration, you can see that pretty much none of it would be correct in an 11th century context late 11th century context, particularly when the First Crusade was happening. And that's sort of a, a prominent theme in, in terms of historical artwork, is many of them contain numerous anachronisms about arms and armor that just were not, you know. <laughs> many manuscript illuminations prominent in the 14th and 15th centuries especially contained many anachronisms in terms of arms and armor shown, uh, medieval clothing, sort of all, the, all of that. We see here on the cover in this 15th century manuscript illumination, uh, we see some burgundines, we see full plate, which really wasn't common until about the mid 14th century, but particularly in the 15th century was when full plate really started to become prominent. And of course, burgundines would not be common until about the later parts of the 14th century. We see some, what may be some early salads, because sort of unlike a bassinet, which kind of just covers really this portion of the head and then has the attached aventail to cover the neck and then close the chin, the salad sort of wisps down on the on the cheek a little bit. And this may be characteristic of an early salad, but it also could depict later German salads. Uh, with the developments in arms and armor, Germans tended to prefer uh, longer sort of plate napes, articulated napes of the, uh, well, lames of plate on the nape of the neck, whilst the Italian salad was characteristically flat from the front to back. Taking a look inside, on page 86 of this edition, Timothy Newark has a depiction of the Seventh Crusade. His commentary reads, The Seventh Crusade, 1248 through 1254, was led by Louis the, uh, the Ninth of France, represented in this curious print, published in 1522, landing at Damietta in Egypt. Here the 13th century crusaders are wearing 16th century dress. You can see there are various full plate harnesses shown, and again, things that were not characteristic of the, of the middle of the 13th century when this crusade was taking place. There are various armets. I see some, maybe some clothes helms and some bassinets. Definitely not 13th century dress. So Newark did a good job of pointing that out in his book. Um, moving on to page 135 of this edition, we see a depiction of the 1346 Battle of Cressy, and Newark's commentary reads, the Battle of Cressy as depicted in an, in an illuminated manuscript of the period. Now, uh, curiously, something that Newark doesn't do on this image is he doesn't uh, explain the anachronisms shown, which I'm sure of course, he knew about, and so he might not have felt the need to really explain that, especially since this this is in the middle of his book on middle, medieval warfare and probably trusts others to know the same. But through the lens of someone who wouldn't um, really understand these anachronisms, who hasn't studied medieval arms and armor as prominently as Timothy Newark and, and um, other scholars have, we would probably take this as 
you know, historically accurate since it's an illuminated man's manuscript of the period implying that it was probably around 1346 when this was painted. However, we see in this picture various full plate harnesses again, which full plate was becoming a thing by 1346, of course, but we see characteristics such as the fold coming over the male skirt, which wouldn't appear prominently on armors until about 1370. We see various, again, brigandines, what may appear to be clothes helms, and um, what looks to even be a frog helm, um, frog mouth helm, excuse me, in the back of the illumination, which would never be worn in combat. That was a tournament helm, and uh, since it was bolted directly to the cuirass, it would not have been worn in actual combat. It would just be too heavy, but for the tournament, it was perfect. So Now again, something I want to point out that caught my eye in the sort of the middle right of this illustration. There seems to be a, a knight or someone of that type um, on his horse uh, wearing what appears to be a bassinet but with um, a visor that I haven't really seen before. To me it looks sort of like a hound skull um, bassinet, so a hound skull visor, but um, those were not prominent until about 1380. So again, this um, kind of visor would not be accurate to the period of Cressy in about 1346. So that really prompted me to really sort of look at the history of the visor bassinet. So in the earlier parts of the 14th century, of course, we know that the bassinet was really coming into play on the battlefield, along with the aventail, which is a, an attached male component that covers the neck and the shoulders. So really, the first bassinets had the aventail directly riveted to the helmet, and then in, in, a, in about the earlier parts, you know, 1320s or so, they began to be removable and attached with little holes called vervails. I recommend watching Knight Aaron's video on YouTube um, for a more in-depth discussion on the Hound Skull and really the inner workings of the bassinet. It is a fantastic video. Um, then, moving into about 1330, we see the introduction of face protection on the va on the bassinet, excuse me, um, in the form of the bretache, or the bretache in French. So, what the bretache is really is a basically a, a nasal, sort of like the nasals of the Norman helms common in the 11th century, um, attached to the chin of the aventail and sort of hooks up and can be secured on the top of the bassinet. So it forms a, a nose guard between the top of the bassinet and the chin of the aventail. And this was particularly prominent in Germany. Also in about 1330, we see the introduction of a true bassinet visor in the form of the clap visor, which is sort of a flat, um, f a flat visor, really. Again, not, not again, but... So not much really in the way of encouraging weapons to glance away from the wearer's a direct impact. Uh, um, so unlike the hound skull bassinets, which has sort of a glancing surface um, for arrows and, and several bladed weapons. The clap visor was really sort of a, just a flattened visor, sort of the earliest type that was attached to the helmet and could flip up so the wearer could breathe um, pretty much unrestricted, unrestricted breath mint. Uh, <laughs> so the clap visor and the bretache were sort of the prominent visor options on the bassinet and the mm, sort of or earlier and middle parts of the 14th century, with the clap visor remaining in use as far as the early 15th century. But something that came to my attention was um, that of a side pivoted mount on a, on a visor for a bassinet. The most prominent uh, depiction of this is, of course, the effigy of Sir Hugh Hastings, who died in 1347. Um, it's a little hard to, it's a little hard to interpret. Um, exactly what this helmet is, or excuse me, this visor is. Um, it has kind of a pointed surface and what looks what look to be breaths um, on the bottom of the visor. And so what, from what I could find about the side pivot mount is that it was common on a, a, Italian armors at the time, but 
other than uh, funeral brasses and, and effigies, I haven't really been able to find um, prominent depictions of this style of visor, probably because it's, it's so poorly depicted in terms of accuracy on the effigies and brasses. So then as we move um, into around the later parts of the 14th century, uh, about 1380 we see the introduction of the true hound skull bassinet, which is the um, pointed, kind of like a dog's muzzle, um, hound skull, uh, dog's hood um, visor that encourages weapons to glance away from the surface of the plate so as to not directly impact and cause concussive force that way. This particular bassinet is housed at the Wallace Collection in London, and you'll notice that it has an attached aventail underneath, and then the visor is um, hinged so it can flip up in combat. And then about 1400, as we move into the later stages of the Hundred Years' War, really we see the introduction of the Great Bassinet. So. The great bassinet could be worn with any kind of visor, really, but most prominently it was worn with the hound skull type. And around this period, the hound skull really started becoming more rounded, uh, and the eye slits uh, started being barred, so it's safer, which really um, it impedes vision and breath. -ness. It impedes vision and uh, and breathability, but really the rounded kind of great bassinet was becoming more popular and uh, it's called a great bassinet because instead of the attached aventail on the bassinet we now have the introduction of gorget plates or gorget plates which are sort of um, steel plates that enclose the throat uh, so there's really no gap between the cuirass or the breastplate of the cuirass and the the neck and then to the chin of the wearer's helmet. So moving back to these um, illustrations, really what we can take away from this is that anachronisms were very common in the medieval period, especially in artwork. Uh, most artwork depicts the arms and armor of their own period rather than the arms and armor that would be um, prominent in the period. So moving back to that depiction of Cressy in uh, Timothy Newark's book. What I think that bassinet visor is is really just um, sort of a, not really an anachronism, but something that would be a little outdated by the time, especially with all the other types of helmets. I believe there's even a, oh, I already mentioned that, but especially a little outdated by this time, um, or maybe just a not really a true design or a unique design for a visor. Um, so, looking at it from the point of view of someone who's not exper as experienced in the um, history of arms and armor really would take this image as historically accurate, and we just have to be careful and, and know that, that that's not always the case with these manuscript illuminations, um, usually not the case. Moving back to the visor of Hugh Hastings, um, generally I think it's regarded as being flat like the clap visor. And um, really the closest thing that I could find that might be uh, close to Hugh Hastings' visor is really this image that shows what looks to be sort of a clap visor with the same pointed little rim when flipped up. So it might have just been depicted poorly on, on uh, Sir Hugh Hastings' effigy. So guys, that's all I really wanted to say um, today about uh, bassinets and historical artwork. Again, I recommend checking out Ian Laspina, Knight Errant's um, videos on this topic. He does a wonderful job of really explaining this in depth and backing it up with historical sources and, and artwork. And so I just thought I'd add, kind of add my own research and thoughts into it, discuss some of these theoreticals behind bassinet visors and arms and armor that we really don't know about all that much as most of the in fact, all of the surviving um, complete harnesses of, of plate armor are, are at least from the 16th century or maybe late 15th century. So anyway, guys, um, I will thank you for watching. And um, if you want to see more of these kind of videos, make sure to let me know and uh, I'll, I'll get on them. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.